Story six of Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story six First Prayer at Haney's. Haney's diggings certainly needed a missionary, if any place ever did. But as one of the boys once remarked during a great lack of water, it had to keep it on a needin'. Zealous men came up by steamship via the isthmus and seemed to consume with their fiery haste to get on board the vessel for China and Japan and carry the glad tidings to the heathen. Self sacrificing souls gave up home and friends and hurried across overland to brave the Pacific and bury themselves among the Australasian savages. But though they all passed in sight of Haney's, none of them paused to give any attention to the souls who had flocked there men came out from frisco and the east to labor with the chinese miners who were the only peaceable and well-behaved people in the mines but the white-faced good-natured hard-swearing generous heavy-drinking enthusiastic murderous anglo-saxons they let severely alone perhaps they thought that hearts in which the good seed had once been sown but failed to come up into fruit were barren soil perhaps they thought it preferable to be killed and eaten by cannibals than to be tumbled into a gulch by a revolver shot while the shootist strolled calmly off in company with his approving conscience never thinking to ascertain whether his bullet had completed the business or whether a wounded man might not have to fight death and coyotes together at any rate the missionaries let haney's alone if any one with an unquenchable desire to carry the word where it is utterly unknown a digestion without fear and a full-proof article of common sense these last two requisites are absolute should be looking for an eligible location haney's is just the place for him and he need give himself no trouble for fear some one would step in before him if he has several dozens of similarly constituted friends, they can all find similar locations by betaking themselves to any mining camp in the West. As Haney's had no preacher, it will be readily imagined it had no church. With the first crowd who located there came an insolvent rum seller from the East. He called himself Pentecost, which was as near his right name as is usual with miners and the boys dubbed his shop pentecost chapel at once the name somehow reached the east for within a few months there reached the post office at haney's a document addressed to preacher in charge of pentecost chapel the postmaster went up and down the brook in high spirits and told the boys they instantly dropped shovel and pan formed line and escorted the postmaster and document to the chapel pentecost acknowledged the joke and stood treat for the crowd after which he solemnly tore the wrapper and disclosed the report of a certain missionary society modestly expressing his gratification at the honor and his unworthiness of it he moved that old thompson who had the loudest voice in the crowd should read the report aloud he pentecost volunteering to furnish thompson all necessary spiritous aid during the continuance of his task thompson promptly signified his acquiescence cleared his throat with a glass of amber-colored liquid and commenced the boys meanwhile listening attentively and commenting critically too much cussed heavenly twang observed one disapprovingly as one letter largely composed of scriptural extracts was read why the deuce didn't he shoot indignantly demanded another as a tale of escape from heathen pursuers was read shot up women in a durned dark room well i'll be durned soliloquized a yellow-haired missourian as thompson read an account of a zanana reckon they'd set an infernal sight higher by women if they was in a diggin six months eh fellers you bet emphatically responded a majority of those present before the boys became very restive thompson finished the pamphlet including a few lines on the cover which stated that the society was greatly in need of funds and that contributions might be sent to the society's financial agent in boston thompson gracefully concluded his service by passing the hat with the following net result 
two revolvers one double-barreled pistol three knives one watch two rings both homemade valuable and fearfully ugly a pocket inkstand a silver tobacco box and forty or fifty ounces of dust and nuggets boston bill who was notoriously absent-minded dropped in a pocket comb but on being sternly called to order by old thompson cursed himself most fluently and redeemed his disgraceful contribution with a gold double eagle the webfoot who was the most unlucky man in camp had been so wrought upon by the tale of one missionary who had lost his all many times in succession sympathetically contributed his only shovel for which act he was enthusiastically cursed and liberally treated at the bar while the shovel was promptly sold at auction to the highest bidder who presented it with a staggering slap between the shoulders to its original owner the remaining non-legal tenders were then converted into gold dust and the whole dispatched by express with a grim note from pentecost to the society's treasurer at boston as the society was controlled by a denomination which does not understand how good can come out of evil no detail of this contribution ever appeared in print but a few months thereafter there did appear at haney's a thin-chested large-headed youth with a heavily loaded mule who announced himself as duly credited by the aforementioned society to preach the gospel among the miners the boys received him cordially and pentecost offered him the nightly hospitality of curling up to sleep in front of the barroom fireplace his mule's load proved to consist largely of tracts which he vigorously distributed and which the boys used to wrap up dust in he nearly starved while trying to learn to cook his own food so some of the boys took him in and fed him he tried to persuade the boys to stop drinking and they good-naturedly laughed but when he attempted to break up the little game which was the only amusement of the camp the only steady amusement for fights were short and irregular the camp rose in its wrath and the young man hastily rose and went for his mule but at the time of which this story treats a missionary would have fared even worse for the boys were wholly absorbed by a very unrighteous but still very darling pleasure a pair of veteran knifists who had fought each other at sight for almost ten years every time they met had again found themselves in the same settlement and haney's had the honor to be that particular settlement judge briggs one of the heroes had many years before discussed with his neighbor billy bent the merits of two opposing brands of mining shovels in the course of the chat they drank considerable villainous whiskey and naturally resorted to knives as final arguments the matter might have ended here had either gained a decided advantage over the other but both were skilful each inflicted and received so near the same number of wounds that the wisest men in camp were unable to decide which whipped now to average californians in the mines this is a most distressing state of affairs the spectators and friends of the combatants waste a great deal of time liquor and blood on the subject while the combatants themselves feel unspeakably uneasy at the neutral ground between victory and defeat at sonora where billy and the judge had their first encounter there was no verdict so the judge indignantly shook the dust from his feet and went elsewhere soon billy happened in at the same place and a set to occurred at sight in which the average was so disarranged both men went about for a month or two in a patched-up condition and then billy roamed off to be soon met by the judge with the usual result both men were known by reputation all through the gold regions and the advent of either at any gulch or washin was the best advertisement the saloon keepers could desire in the east hundreds of men would have tried to reason the men out of this feud and some few would have forcibly separated them while fighting but in the diggings any interference in such matters was considered impertinent and deserving of punishment 
haney's had been fairly excited for a week for the judge had arrived the week before and his points had been carefully scrutinized and weighed time and again by every man in the camp there seemed nothing unusual about him he was of middle size and long hair and beard a not unpleasant expression and very dirty clothes he never jumped a claim always took his whiskey straight played as fair a game of poker as the average of the boys and never stole a mule from any one whiter than a mexican the boys had just about ascertained all this and made their blind bets on the result of the next fight when the whole camp was convulsed with the intelligence that billy bent had also arrived work immediately ceased except in the immediate vicinity of the champions and the boys stuck close to the chapel that being the spot where the encounter should naturally take place miners thronged in from fifty miles around and nothing but a special mule express saved the camp from the horror of pentecost's bar being inadequate to the demand between straight bets and hedging most of the gold dust in camp had been put up for a bet is the only california backing of an opinion as the men did not seem to seek each other the boys had ample time to grind things down to a pint as the camp concisely expressed it and the matter had given excuse for a dozen minor fights when order was suddenly restored one afternoon by the entrance of billy and his neighbors just as the judge and his neighbors were finishing a drink the boys immediately and silently formed a ring on the outer edge of which were amassed all the men who had been outside and who came pouring in like flies before a shower no one squatted or hugged the wall for it was understood that these two men fought only with knives so the spectators were in a state of abject safety the judge after settling for the drinks turned and saw for the first time his enemy hello billy said he pleasantly let's take a drink first billy who was a red-haired man with a snapping turtle mouth but not a vicious-looking man for all that briefly replied all right and these two determined enemies clinked their glasses with the unconcern of mere social drinkers but after this they proceeded promptly to business the judge who was rather slow on his guard was the owner of a badly cut arm within three minutes by the barkeeper's watch but not until he had given billy who was parrying a thrust an ugly gash in his left temple there was a busy hum during the adjustment of bets on first blood and the combatants very considerately refrained from doing serious injury during this temporary distraction but within five minutes more they had exchanged chest wounds but too slight to be dangerous betting became furious each man fought so splendidly that the boys were wild with delight and enthusiasm bets were roared back and forth and when pentecost by virtue of his universally conceded authority commanded silence there was a great deal of finger telegraphy across the circle and head shaking in return such exquisite carving had never before been seen at haney's that was freely admitted by all men pitied absent miners all over the state and wondered why this delightful lingering long drawn out system of slaughter was not more popular than the brief and commonplace method of the revolver the webfoot rapturously and softly quoted the good doctor's watts my willing soul would stay in such a place as this and when suddenly his cup of bliss was clashed to the ground for billy stumbling fell upon his own knife and received a severe cut in the abdomen wounds of this sort are generally fatal and the boys had experience enough in such matters to know it in an instant the men who had been calmly viewing a life-and-death conflict bestirred themselves to help the sufferer pentecost passed the bottle of brandy over the counter half a dozen men ran to the spring for cold water others hastily tore off coats and even shirts with which to soften a bench for the wounded man no one went for the doctor for that worthy had been viewing the fight professionally from the first and had knelt beside the wounded man at exactly the right moment 
after a brief examination he gave his opinion in the following professional style no go billy you're done for good god exclaimed the judge who had watched the doctor with breathless interest ain't there no chance nary replied the doctor decidedly i'm a ruined man i'm a used-up cuss said the judge with a look of bitter anguish i'd wish i'd gone under too easy old hoss suggested one of the boys you didn't do him you know that's what's the matter roared the judge savagely nobody'll ever know which of us whipped and the judge sorrowful took himself off declining most resolutely to drink many hearts were full of sympathy for the judge but the poor fellow on the bench seemed to need most just then he had asked for some one who could write and was dictating in whispers a letter to some person then he drank some brandy and then some water then he freely acquitted the judge of having ever fought any way but fairly but still his mind seemed burdened finally in a very thin weak voice he stammered out i don't want to make to, to make it uncomfortable for, for, for any of you fellers but is, is there a, a preacher in the camp the boys looked at each other inquiringly men from every calling used to go to the mines and no one would have been surprised if a backsliding priest or even bishop had stepped to the front but none appeared and the wounded man after looking despairingly from one to another gave a smothered cry oh god as a miserable wretch got to cut hisself open and then flicker out without anybody to say a prayer for him the boys looked sorrowful if gold dust could have bought prayers billy would have had a first-class assortment in an instant there's a deacon adams over to patton's suggested a bystander and they do say he's a regular rip roaring at praying but twould take four hours to go and fetch him too long said the doctor down in mexico at the cathedral said another they pray for a feller after he's dead when you pay him for it and they say it's just the thing sure pop i'll give you my word billy and no go back that i'll see the job done up in style for yer ef that's any comfort i want to hear it myself groaned the sufferer i don't feel right can't nobody pray nobody in the crowd again the boys looked inquiringly at each other but this time it was a little shyly if he had asked for some one to go out and steal a mule or kill a bear or gallop a buck-jumping mustang to frisco they would have fought for the chance but praying praying was entirely out of their line the silence became painful soon slouched hats were hauled down over moist eyes and shirt sleeves and bare arms seemed to find something unusual to attend to in the boys faces big brooks commenced to blubber aloud and was led out by old thompson who wanted a chance to get out of doors so he might break down in private finally matters were brought to a crisis by mose no one knew his other name mose uncovered a sandy head face and beard and remarked i don't want to put on airs in this here crowd but if nobody else can say a word to the lord about billy bent i'm a-goin to do it myself it's a business i've never been in but there's nothing like tryin this meetin'll come to order to onct hats off in church gentlemen commanded pentecost off came every hat and some of the boys knelt down as mose knelt beside the bench and said oh lord here's billy bent needs attendin' to he's panned out his last dust and it seems to have a pretty clear idea that this is his last chance he wants you to give him a lift lord and it's the opinion of this house that he needs it tain't none of our business what he's done and if it was you'd know more about it than we could tell yer but it's mighty sartin that a cuss that's been in the diggings for years needs a sight of mendin up before he kicks the bucket oh, that's so responded two or three very emphatically billy's down lord and no decent man believes that the lord had hit a man when he's down so there's one or two things got to be done either he's got to be let alone or he's got to be helped letting him alone won't do him or anybody else any good so helpin's the holt and as any one nigh us tough fellers would help if we knew how to it's only fair to suppose that the lord'll do a mighty sight quicker 
now what billy needs is to see the thing in that light and you can make him do it a good deal better than we can it's mighty little for the lord to do but it's meat and drink and clothes to billy just now when we was boys some of us read some promises of yourn in the book that was writ a good spell ago by chaps in the old country and though sunday school teachers and preachers mixed the matter up in our minds and got us all tangle foot we know they're dar and you'll know what we mean now lord billy's jest the boy he's a hard case so you can't find no better stuff to work on he's in a bad fix that we can't do nothin for so it's just your chance ain't exactly the chap to make an a number one angel if but he ain't the man to forget a friend so he'll be a handy feller to have round feel any better billy said mose stopping the prayer for a moment a little said billy feebly but you want to tell the whole yarn i'm sorry for all the wrong i've done he's sorry for all his deviltry lord and i ain't got nothing agin the judge continued the sufferer and he don't bear no malice agin the judge which he shouldn't seein he generally gin as good as he took and the long and short of it lord is just this he's a dyin and he wants a chance to die with his mind easy and nobody else can make it so so we leave the whole job in your hands only puttin in for billy's comfort that we recollect hearing how you're forgiven a dyin thief and that it ain't likely you're a-goin to do harder on a chap that's always paid for what he got that's the whole story amen billy's hand rapidly growing cold reached for that of mose and he said with a considerable effort mose you come in as handy as a nugget in a gone-up claim god bless you mose i feel better inside if i get through the clouds and have a livin chance to say a word to them as is the chief's dar that word'll be for you mose god bless you mose and ef my blessin no account it can cuss yer anyhow this claim's washed out fellers and here goes the last shovelful to see if there's any gold in it or not and billy departed this life and the boys drank to the repose of his soul end of story six story seven of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story seven the new sheriff of bunker county he suited the natives exactly what they would have done had he not been available they shuddered to contemplate the county was so new a one that but three men had occupied the sheriff's office before charlie mansell was elected of the three the first had not collected taxes with proper vigor the second was so steadily drunk that aggrieved farmers had to take the law in their own hands regarding horse thieves the third was while a terrible man on the chase or in a fight so good-natured and lazy at other times that the county came to be overrun with rascals but charlie mansell fulfilled every duty of his office with promptness and thoroughness he was not very well known to be sure but neither was any one else among the four or five thousand inhabitants of the new county he had arrived about a year before election day and established himself as repairer of clocks and watches an occupation which was so unprofitable at bunkerville the county town that charlie had an immense amount of leisure time at his disposal he never hung about the stores or liquor shop after dark he never told doubtful stories or displayed unusual ability with cards neither did he on the other hand identify himself with either of the bunkerville churches and yet every one liked him perhaps it was because although short he was straight and plump whereas the other inhabitants were thin and bent from many discouraging tussles with ague perhaps it was because he was always the first to see the actual merits and demerits of any subject of conversation perhaps it was because he was more eloquent in defence of what he believed to be right than the village pastors were in defence of the holy truths to which they were committed 
perhaps it was because he argued squire backett out of foreclosing a mortgage on the widow worth when every one else feared to approach the squire on the subject but no matter what the reason was charlie mansell became every one's favorite and gave no one an excuse to call him enemy he took no interest in politics but one day when a brutal ruffian who had assaulted a lame native escaped because the easy-going sheriff was too slow in pursuing charlie was heard to exclaim oh if i were sheriff the man who heard him was both impressionable and practical he said that charlie's face when he made that remark looked like christ's might have looked when he was angry but the hearer also remembered that the sheriff incumbent's term of office had nearly expired and he quietly gathered a few leading spirits of each political party with the result that charlie was nominated and elected on a fusion ticket when elected charlie properly declined on the ground that he could not file security bonds but within half an hour of the time the county clerk received the letter of declination at least a dozen of the most solid citizens of the county waited upon the sheriff-elect and volunteered to go upon his bond so charlie became sheriff in spite of himself and he acquitted himself nobly he arrested a murderer the very day after his sureties were accepted and although charlie was by far the smaller and paler of the two the murderer submitted tamely and dared not look into charlie's eye instead of scolding the delinquent taxpayers the new sheriff sympathized with them and the county treasury filled rapidly the self-appointed regulators caught a horse thief a week or two after charlie's installment into office and were about to quietly hang him after the time-honored custom of western regulators when charlie dashed into the crowd pointed his pistol at the head of deacon bent the leader of the enraged citizens remarked that all sorts of murder were contrary to the law he had sworn to maintain and then led the thief off to jail the regulators were speechless with indignation for the space of five minutes then they hurried to the jail and when charlie mansell with pale face but set teeth again presented his pistol they astonished him with three roaring cheers after which each man congratulated him on his courage in short bunkerville became a quiet place the new sheriff even went so far as to arrest the disturbers of camp meetings yet the village boys endorsed him heartily and would at his command go to jail in squads of half a dozen with no escort but the sheriff himself had it not been that charlie occasionally went to prayer meetings and church not a rowdy at bunkerville could have found any fault with him but not even in an out-of-the-way malarious missouri village could a model sheriff be forever the topic of conversation civilization moved forward in that part of the world in very queer conveyances sometimes and with considerable friction gamblers murderers horse thieves counterfeiters and all sorts of swindlers were numerous in lands so near the border and bunkerville was not neglected by them neither greenbacks nor national bank notes were known at that time and home productions in the financial direction being very unpopular there was a decided preference exhibited for the notes of eastern banks and no sooner would the issues of any particular bank grow very popular in the neighborhood of bunkerville than merchants began to carefully examine every note bearing the name of said bank lest haply some counterfeiter had endeavored to assist in supplying the demand at one particular time the suspicions had numerous and well-founded grounds where they came from nobody knew but the county was full of them and full too of wretched people who held the doubtful notes it was the usual habit of the bunkerville merchants to put the occasional counterfeits which they received into the drawer with their good notes and pass them when unconscious of the fact but at the time referred to the bad notes were all on the same bank and it was not easy work to persuade the natives to accept even the genuine issues 
the merchants sent for the sheriff and the sheriff questioned hostlers liquor sellers ferry owners toll-gate keepers and other people in the habit of receiving money but the questions were to no effect these people had all suffered but at the hands of respectable citizens and no worse by one than by another suddenly the sheriff seemed to get some trace of the counterfeiters an old negro who saw money so seldom that he accurately remembered the history of all the currency in his possession had received a bad note from an immigrant in payment for some hams a fortnight later he sold some feathers to a different immigrant and got a note which neither the storekeeper or liquor seller would accept the negro was sure the wagon and horses of the second immigrant were the same as those of the first then the sheriff mounted his horse and gave chase he needed only to ask the natives along the road leading out of bunkerville to show him any money they had received of late to learn what route the wagon had taken on its second trip about this time the natives of bunkerville began to wonder whether the young sheriff was not more brave than prudent he had started without associates for he had never appointed a deputy he might have a long chase and into counties where he was unknown and might be dangerously delayed the final decision or the only one of any consequence was made by four of the regulators who decided to mount and hurry after the sheriff and volunteer their aid by taking turns in riding ahead of their own party these volunteers learned at the end of the first day that charlie could not be more than ten miles in advance they determined therefore to push on during the night so long as they could be sure they were on the right track an hour more of riding brought them to a cabin where they received startling intelligence an immigrant wagon drawn by very good horses had driven by at a trot which was a gait previously unheard of in the case of immigrant horses then a young man on horseback had passed at a lively gallop a few moments later a shot had been heard in the direction of the road the wagon had taken why hadn't the owner of the house hurried up the road to see what was the matter because he minded his own business and stayed in the house when he heard shooting he said come on boys shouted bill bramer giving his panting horse a touch with his rawhide whip perhaps the sheriff's needin help this minute and there's generally rewards when counterfeiters are captured maybe sheriff will give us a share the whole quartet galloped rapidly off it was growing dark but there was no danger of losing a road which was the only one in that part of the country as they approached a clearing a short distance in front of them they saw a dark mass in the center of the road its outline indicating an immigrant wagon of the usual type there they are shouted bill bramer but where's sheriff good lord the shot must have hit him reckon it did said pete williamson thrusting his head forward there's some kind of an animal hid behind that wagon and it don't enjoy being led along for it's kickin mighty lively wouldn't wonder if twas mansell's own pony hoss thieves too then inquired bramer then maybe there'll be two rewards yes said williamson's young brother and maybe we're leavin poor charlie a dyin along behind us in the bushes somewhere who'll go back and help hunt for him the quartet unconsciously slackened speed and the members thereof gazed rather sheepishly at each other through the gathering twilight at length the younger williamson abruptly turned dismounted and walked slowly backward peering in the bushes and examining all indications in the road the other three resumed their rapid gallop pete williamson remarking that boy allus was the saint of the family look out for long shot boys and if there's any money in this job he's to have a fair share of it that is sheriff's horse sure as shootin he shall have half of what i make out of it how'll we take em boys bill right sam left and me the rear if i should get plugged and there's any money for the crowd i'll count on you two to see that brother jim gets my share he's got more the mother in him than all four of us other brothers and why don't they shoot do you s'pose 
perhaps there ain't nobody but the driver and he's got his hands full making them hosses travel along that lively suggested bill braymer or maybe he ain't got time to load like enough he's captured the sheriff and is a-taking him off we got to be careful how we shoot the men gained steadily on the wagon and finally bill braymer felt sure enough to shout halt or we'll fire the only response was a sudden flash at the rear of the wagon at the same instant the challenger's horse fell dead hang cheerfulness about firing exclaimed braymer i'm a goin to blaze away another shot came from the wagon and williamson's horse uttered a genuine cry of anguish and stumbled the indignant rider hastily dismounted and exclaimed it's mighty kind of em not to shoot us but they know how to get away all the same they know too much about shootin for me to foller em any more remarked the third man running rapidly out of the road and in the shadow caused by a tree they can't keep up that gate forever said bill braymer i'm going to foller em on foot if it takes all night i'll get even with em for that hoss they've done me out of i'm with you bill remarked pete williamson and maybe we can snatch their horses just to show em how it feels the third man lifted up his voice allow i've had enough of this here kind of thing said he and i'll get back to the settlement while there's anything for me to get there on i reckon you'll make a haul but i don't care i'd rather be poor than spend a counterfeiter's money and off he rode just as the younger williamson with refreshed horse dashed up exclaiming no signs of him back yonder but there's blood tracks beginning in the middle of the road and leanin' along this way come on and away he galloped while his brother remarked to his companion if he should have luck and get the reward you be sure to tell him all the good things i've said about him won't you jim williamson rode rapidly in the direction of the wagon until finding himself alone and remembering what had befallen his companions he dismounted tied his horse to a tree and pursued rapidly on foot he soon saw the wagon looming up in front of him again and was puzzled to know how to reach it and learn the truth when the wagon turned abruptly off the road and apparently into the forest following as closely as he could under cover of the timber he found that after picking its way among the trees for a mile it stopped before a small log cabin of whose existence jim had never known before there were some groans plainly audible as jim saw one man get out of the wagon and half carry and half drag another man into the hut a moment later and a streak of light appeared under the door of the hut and there seemed to be no windows in the structure if there were they were covered jim remained behind a sheltering tree for what seemed two hours and then stealthily approached the wagon no one was in it then he removed his boots and stole on tiptoe to the hut at first he could find no chink or crevice through which to look but finally on one side of the log chimney he spied a ray of light approaching the hole and applying his eye to it jim beheld a picture that startled him into utter dumbness on the floor of the hut which was entirely bare lay a middle-aged man with one arm bandaged and bleeding seated on the floor holding the head of the wounded man and raining kisses upon it sat bunker county sheriff then jim heard some conversation which did not in the least allay his astonishment don't cry daughter said the wounded man faintly i deserve to be shot by you i haven't wronged any one half so much as i had you again the wounded man received a shower of kisses and hot tears fell rapidly upon his face arrest me take me back send me to state's prison continued the man nobody has no good or right then i'll feel as if your mother was honestly avenged i'll feel better if you'll promise to do it father dear said the sheriff i might have suspected it was you oh if i had have done but i thought i hoped i had got away from the roach of the cursed business forever i've endured everything i've nearly died of loneliness to avoid it and then to think that i should have hurt my own father you're your mother's own daughter nelly said the counterfeiter it takes all the pain away to know that i haven't ruined you that some member of my wretched family is honest i'd be happy in a prisoner's box if i could look at you and feel that you put me there 
you shan't be made happy in that way said the sheriff i've got you again and i'm going to keep you to myself i'll nurse you here you say that nobody ever found this hut but but the gang and when you're better the wagon shall take us both to some place where we can live or starve together the county can get another sheriff easy enough and they'll suspect you of being in league with counterfeiters said the father they may suspect me of anything they like exclaimed the sheriff so you love me and be be your own best self and my good father but this bare hut not a comfort that you need no food nothing oh if there was only some one who had a heart and could help us there is whispered jim williamson with all his might both occupants started and the wounded man's eyes glared like a wolf's don't be frightened whispered jim i'm yours body and soul the devil himself would be if he'd been standing at this hole the last five minutes i'm jim williamson let me help you miss uh sheriff the sheriff blew out the light opened the door and called softly to jim led him into the hut closed the door relighted the candle and blushed jim looked at the sheriff out of the top of his eyes and then blushed himself then he looked at the wounded man there was for a moment an awkward silence which jim broke by clearing his throat violently after which he said now both of you make your minds easy nobody'll never find you here i've hunted through all these woods but never saw this cabin before arm broke no said the counterfeiter but but it runs in the family to shoot ugly again the sheriff kissed the man repeatedly then you can move in two or three days said jim if you're taken care of rightly nobody'll suspect anything wrong about the sheriff if he don't turn up again right away i'll go back to town throw everybody off the track and bring out a few things to make you comfortable jim looked at the sheriff again blushed again and started for the door the wounded man sprang to his feet and hoarsely whispered swear ask god to send you to hell if you play false swear by everything you love and respect and hope for that you won't let my daughter be disgraced because she happened to have a rascal for her father jim hesitated for a moment and then he seized the sheriff's hand i ain't used to swearin except on something i can see said he and the business is only done in one way with this he kissed the little hand in his own and dashed out of the cabin with a very red face within ten minutes jim met his brother and bramer no use boys said he might as well go back there ain't no fears but what the sheriff will be smart enough to do em yet if he's alive and if he's dead we can't help him anyway if he's dead remarked bill bramer and there's any pay due him i hope part of it'll come for these horses mine's dead and pete's might as well be well said jim i'll go on to town i want to be out early in the morning and see if i can't get a deer and it's time i was in bed and jim galloped off the horse and man which might have been seen threading the woods at early daybreak on the following morning might have set for a picture of one of sherman's bummers for a month afterward jim's mother bemoaned the unaccountable absence of a tin pail a meal bag two or three blankets her only pair of scissors and sundry other useful articles while her sorrow was increased by the fact that she had to replenish her household stores sooner than she had expected the sheriff examined so eagerly the articles which jim deposited in rapid succession on the cabin floor that jim had nothing to do but look at the sheriff which he did industriously though not exactly to his heart's content at last the sheriff looked up and jim saw two eyes full of tears and a pair of lips which parted and trembled in a manner very unbecoming in a sheriff don't please said jim appealingly i wish i could have done better for you but somehow i couldn't think of nothing in the house that was fit for a woman set the scissors don't think about me at all said the sheriff quickly i care for nothing for myself forget that i'm alive i i can't stammered jim looking as guilty as forty counterfeiters rolled into one the sheriff turned away quickly while the father called jim to his side 
young man said he you've been as good as an angel could have been but if you suspect her a minute of being my accomplice may heaven blast you i taught her engraving villain that i was but when she found out what the work really was i thought she'd have died she begged and begged that i'd give the business up and i promised and promised but it isn't easy to get out of a crowd of your own kind particularly when you're not so much of a man as you should be at last she got sick of waiting and ran away then i grew desperate and worse than ever i've been searching everywhere for her you don't suppose a smart smart counterfeiter has to get rid of his money in the way i've been doing do you i traced her to this part of the state and i've been going over the roads again and again trying to find her but i never saw her until she put this hole through my arm last night i hadn't any idea who you were interrupted the sheriff with a face so full of mingled indignation pain and tenderness that jim couldn't for the life of him take his eyes from it don't let any one suspect her young man continued the father i'll stay within reach deliver me up if it should be necessary to clear her trust to me said jim i know a man when i see him even if he is a woman two days later the sheriff rode into town leading behind him the counterfeiter's horses with the wagon and its contents with thousands of dollars in counterfeit money the counterfeiter had escaped he said and he had wounded him bunkerville ran wild with enthusiasm and when the sheriff insisted upon paying out of his own pocket the value of bramer's and williamson's horses men of all parties agreed that charlie mansell should be run for congress on an independent ticket but the sheriff declined the honor and declaring that he had heard of the serious illness of his father insisted upon resigning and leaving the country like an affectionate son he purchased some dress goods which he said might please his mother and then he departed leaving the whole town in sorrow there was one man in bunkerville who did not suffer so severely as he might have done by the sheriff's departure had not his mind been full of strange thoughts pete williamson began to regard his brother with suspicion and there seemed some ground for his feeling jim was unnaturally quiet and abstracted he had been a great deal with the sheriff before that official's departure and yet did not seem to be on as free and pleasant terms with him as before so pete slowly gathered a conviction that the sheriff was on the track of a large reward from the bank injured by the counterfeiter that jim was to have a share for his services on the eventful night that there was some disagreement between them on the subject and that jim was trying the unbrotherly trick of keeping his luck a secret from the brother who had resolved to fraternally share anything he might have obtained by the chase finally when pete charged his brother with the unkindness alluded to and jim looked dreadfully confused pete's suspicions were fully confirmed the next morning jim and his horse were absent ascertaining which fact the irate peter started in pursuit for several days he traced his brother and finally learned that he was at a hotel on the iowa border the landlord said he couldn't be seen he and a handsome young fellow with a big trunk and a tall thin man and ex-judge bates were busy together and had left word they weren't to be disturbed for a couple of hours on any account could pete hang about the door of the room so as to see him as soon as possible he was his brother well yes the landlord thought there wouldn't be any harm in that the unscrupulous peter put his eye to the keyhole he saw the sheriff daintily dressed and as pretty a lady as ever was in spite of her short hair he heard the judge say by virtue of the authority in me vested by the state of iowa i pronounce you man and wife and then with vacant countenance he sneaked slowly away murmuring that's the sort of reward he got is it and continued pete after a moment which was apparently one of special inspiration i'll bet that's the kind of deer he said he was going for in the mornin after the chase end of story seven story eight of a romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain 
story eight major mart's friend east patton was one of the quietest places in the world the indisposition of a family horse or cow was cause for animated general conversation and the displaying of a new poster or prospectus on the post office door was the signal for a spirited gathering of citizens why therefore major mart had spent the whole of three successive leaves of absence at east patton where he hadn't a relative and where no other soldier lived no one could imagine even professional newsmakers never assigned any reason for it for although their vigorous and experienced imaginations were fully capable of forming some plausible theory on the subject of the major's fondness for east patton they shrank from making public the results of any such labors it was perfectly safe to circulate some purely original story about any ordinary citizens but there was no knowing how a military man might treat such a matter when it reached his ears as it was morally sure to do live military men had not been seen in east patton since the revolutionary war three-quarters of a century before the villagers first saw major mart and such soldiers as had been revealed to east patton through the medium of print were as dangerously touchy as the hair triggers of their favorite weapons so east patton let the major's private affairs alone and was really glad to see the major in person there was a scarcity of men at east patton of interesting men at least for the undoubted sanctity of the old men let no particular graces to their features or manners while the young men were merely the residuum of an active immigration which had for some years been setting westward from east patton when therefore the tall straight broad-shouldered clear-eyed much whiskered major appeared on the street looking as he always did as if he had just been shaved brushed and polished the sight was an extremely pleasing one except to certain young men who feared for the validity of their titles to their respective sweethearts should the major chance to be affectionate but the major gave no cause for complaint when he first came to the village he bought rose cottage opposite the splendid whittleday property and he spent most of his time his leave of absence always occurring in the summer season in his garden trimming his shrubs nursing his flowering plants growing magnificent roses and in some ways acting utterly unlike a man of blood occasionally he played a game of chess with parson fisher the jolly ex-clergyman or smoked a pipe with the saddler postmaster he attended all the east patent tea parties too but he made himself so uniformly agreeable to all the ladies that the mothers in israel agreed with many sighs that the major was not a marrying man it may easily be imagined then that when one summer the major reappeared at east patton with a brother officer who was young and reasonably good-looking the major's popularity did not diminish the young man was introduced as lieutenant doyson who had once saved the major's life by a lucky shot as that chieftain with empty pistols was trying to escape from a well-mounted indian and all the young ladies in town declared they knew the lieutenant must have done something wonderful he was so splendid but with that fickleness which seems in many ways communicable from wicked cities to virtuous villages east patton suddenly ceased to exhibit unusual interest in the pair of warriors for a new excitement had convulsed the village mind to its very centre it was whispered that mrs whittleday the sole and widowed owner of the great whittleday property had wearied of the mourning she wore for the husband she had buried two years previously and that she would soon publicly announce the fact by laying aside her weeds and giving a great entertainment to which every one was to be invited there was considerable high-toned deprecation of so early a cessation of mrs whittleday's sorrowing she being still young and handsome and there was some fault found on the economic ground that the widow couldn't yet have half worn out her mourning garments but as to the propriety of her giving an entertainment the voices of east patton were as one in the affirmative 
such of the villagers as had chance to sit at meat with the late scott whittleday had reported that dishes with unremembered foreign names were as plenty as were the plainer viands on the tables of the old inhabitants such east patonites as had not been entertained at the whittleday board rejoiced in a prospect of believing by sight as well as by faith the report proved to have unusually good foundation within a fortnight each respectable householder received a note intimating that mrs whittleday would be pleased to see self and family on the evening of the following thursday the time was short and the resources of the single store at east patton were limited but the natives did their best and the eventful evening brought to mrs whittleday's handsome parlors a few gentlemen and ladies and a large number of good people who with all the heroism of a forlorn hope were doing their best to appear at ease and happy the major and lieutenant were there of course and both in uniform by special request of the hostess the major who had met mrs whittleday in city society before her husband's death and who had maintained a bowing acquaintance with her during her widowhood gravely presented the lieutenant to mrs whittleday made a gallant speech about the debt society owed to her for again condescending to smile upon it and then presented his respects to the nearest of the several groups of ladies who were gazing invitingly at him then he summoned the lieutenant whose reluctance to leave mrs whittleday's side was rendered no less by a bright smile which that lady gave him as he departed and made him acquainted with ladies of all ages and of greatly varying personal appearance the young warrior went through the ordeal with only tolerable composure and improved his first opportunity to escape and regain the society of the hostess two or three moments later just as mrs whittleday turned aside to speak to stately old judge bray the lieutenant found himself being led rapidly toward the veranda the company had not yet found its way out of the parlors to any extent so the major locked the lieutenant's arm in his own commenced a gentle promenade and remarked fred my boy you're making an ass of yourself oh nonsense major answered the young man with considerable impatience i don't want to know all these queer old-fashioned people they're worse than a lot of plebes at west point i don't mean that fred though if you don't want to make talk you must make yourself agreeable but you're too attentive to mrs whittleday by george responded the lieutenant eagerly how can i help it she's divine a great many others think so too fred i do myself but they don't make it so plagued evident on short acquaintance behave yourself now your eyesight is good sit down and play the agreeable to some old lady and look at mrs whittleday across the room as often as you like the lieutenant was young his face was not under good control and he had no whiskers and very little moustache to hide it so although he obeyed the order of his superior it was with a visage so mournful that the major imagined when once or twice he caught mrs whittleday's eye that that handsome lady was suffering from restrained laughter humorous as the affair had seemed to the major before he could not endure to have his preserver's sorrow the cause of merriment in any one else so deputing parson fisher to make their excuse to the hostess when it became possible to penetrate the crowd which had slowly surrounded her the major took his friend's arm and returned to the cottage major exclaimed the subaltern i, I half wish i'd let that indian catch you then you wouldn't have spoiled the pleasantest evening i ever had ever began to have i should say you wouldn't have had an evening at east patton then fred said the major with a laugh as he passed the cigars and lit one himself seriously my boy you must be more careful you came here to spend a pleasant three months with me and the first time you're in society you act to a lady you never saw before too in such a way that if it had been any one but a lady of experience she would have imagined you in love with her i am in love with her declared the young man with a look which was intended to be defiant but which was noticeably shamefaced 
i'm going to tell her so too that is i'm going to write her about it steady fred steady urged the major kindly she'd be more provoked than pleased don't you suppose fifty men have worshipped her at first sight they have and she knows it too but it hasn't troubled her mind at all handsome women know they turn men's heads in that way and they generally respect the men who are sensible enough to hold their tongues about it at least until there's acquaintance enough between them to justify a little confidence major said poor fred very meekly almost piteously don't don't you suppose i could make her care something for me the major looked thoughtfully and then tenderly at the cigar he held between his fingers and finally he said very gently my dear boy perhaps you could would it be fair though love in earnest means marriage would you torment a poor woman who's lost one husband into wondering three-quarters of the time whether the scalp of another isn't in the hands of some villainous apache the unhappy lieutenant hid his face in heavy clouds of tobacco smoke well said he springing to his feet and pacing the floor like a caged animal i'll tell you what i'll do i'll write her and throw my heart at her feet of course she won't care it's just as you say why should she but i'll do it and then i'll go back to the regiment i hate to spoil your fun major if it's any fun to you to have such a fool in your quarters but the fact is the enemy's too much for me i wouldn't feel worse if i was facing a division i'll write her to-morrow i'd rather be refused by her than loved by any other woman put it off a fortnight fred suggested the major it's the polite thing to call within a week after this party you'll have a chance then to become better acquainted with her she's delightful company i'm told perhaps you'll make up your mind it's better to enjoy her society during our leave than to throw away everything in a forlorn hope wait a fortnight that's a sensible youth i can't major cried the excited boy hang it you're an old soldier don't you know how infernally uncomfortable it is to stand still and be shot at i do my boy said the major with considerable emphasis and a uh, far-away look uh, nothing in particular well that'll be my fix as long as i stay here and keep quiet replied the lieutenant wait a week then persisted the major you don't want to be guilty of conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman eh? don't spoil her first remembrance of the first freedom she's known for a couple of years well call it a week then moodily replied the lovesick brave lighting a candle and moving towards his room i suppose it will take me a week anyway to make up a letter fit to send to such an angel the major sighed put on an easy coat and slippers and stepped into his garden poor fred he muttered to himself as he paced the walk in front of the piazza can't wait a fortnight huh wonder what he would say if he knew i'd been waiting for seven or eight years if he knew i fell in love with her as easily as he did and that i've never recovered myself wonder what he'd do if some one were to marry her almost before his very eyes as poor whittleday did while i was longing for her acquaintance wonder what sort of fool he'd call me if he knew that i came to east patton time after time just for a chance of looking at her that i bought rose cottage merely to be near her that i kept it all to myself and for a couple of years had felt younger at the thought that i might perchance win her after all poor fred and yet why shouldn't she marry him women have done stranger things and he's a great deal more attractive looking than an old campaigner like myself well god bless em both and have mercy on an old coward the major looked toward the whittleday mansion the door was open the last guests were evidently departing and their beautiful entertainer was standing in the doorway a flood of light throwing into perfect relief her graceful and tastefully dressed figure she said something laughingly to the departing guests it seemed exquisite music to the major then the door closed and the major with a groan retired within his own door and sorrowfully consumed many cigars the week that followed was a very dismal one to the major he petted his garden as usual and whistled softly to himself as was his constant habit 
but he insanely pinched the buds off the flowering plants and his whistling sometimes plaintive sometimes hopeless sometimes wrathful sometimes vindictive in expression was restricted to the execution of dead marches alone he jeopardized his queen so often at chess that parson fisher deemed it only honourable to call the major's attention to his misplays and to allow him to correct them the saddler postmaster noticed that the major usually a most accomplished smoker now consumed a great many matches in relighting each pipe that he filled only once during the week did he chance to meet mrs whittleday and then the look which accompanied his bow and raised hat was so solemn that his fair neighbour was unusually sober herself for a few moments while she wondered whether she could in any way have given the major offence as for the lieutenant he sat at the major's desk for many sorrowful hours each day the general result being a large number of closely written and finely torn scraps in the waste-basket then coatless collarless with open vest and hair disarranged in the manner traditional among lovesick youths he would pour mournful airs from a flute the major complained rather frequently for a man who had spent years on the plains of draughts from the front windows which windows he finally kept closed most of the time thus saving mrs whittleday the annoyance which would certainly have resulted from the noise made by the earnest but unskilled amateur for the major himself however neither windows nor doors could afford relief and when one day the sergeant accidentally overturned a heavy table which fell upon the flute and crushed it the major enjoyed the only happy moments that were his during the week the week drew very near its close the major had with a heavy but desperate heart told stories sung songs brought up tactical points for discussion he even waxed enthusiastic in favour of a run through europe he of course to bear all the expenses but the subaltern remained faithful and obdurate finally the morning of the last day arrived and the lieutenant to the major's surprise and delight appeared at the table with a very resigned air major said he i wouldn't mention it under any other circumstance but i saved your life once you did my boy god bless you responded the major promptly well now i want to ask a favour on the strength of that act i'll never ask another it's no use for me to try to write to her the harder i try the more contemptible my words appear now what i ask is this you write me a rough draft of what's fit to send to such an incomparable being and i'll copy it and send it over i don't expect any answer all i want to do is to throw myself away on her but i want to do it handsomely and hang it i don't know how write just as if you were doing it for yourself will you do it the major tried to wash his heart out of his throat with a sip of coffee and succeeded but partially yet the appealing look of his favourite added to the unconscious pathos of his tone restored to him his self-command and he replied i'll do it fred right away don't spoil your breakfast for it any time this morning will do said the lieutenant as the major rose from the table but the veteran needed an excuse for leaving his breakfast untouched and he rather abruptly stepped upon the piazza and indulged in a thoughtful promenade write just as if you were doing it for yourself the young man's words rang constantly in his ears and before the major had thought many moments he determined to do exactly what he was asked to do this silly performance of the lieutenant's would of course put an end to the acquaintanceship of the major and mrs whittleday unless that lady were most unusually gracious why should he not say to her over the subaltern's name all that he had for years been hoping for an opportunity to say no matter that she would not imagine who was the real author of the letter it would still be an unspeakable comfort to write the words and know that her eyes would read them that her heart would perhaps probably in fact pity the writer 
the major seated himself wrote erased interlined rewrote and finally handed to the lieutenant a sheet of letter paper of which nearly a page was covered with the major's very characteristic chirography by gracious major exclaimed the lieutenant his face having lightened perceptibly during the perusal of the letter that's magnificent i declare it puts hope into me and yet confound it it's plaguy like marching under someone else's colours never mind my boy copy it sign it and send it over and don't hope too much the romantic young brave copied the letter carefully line for line he spoilt several envelopes in addressing one to suit him and then dispatched the missive by the major's servant laying the rough draft away for future and probably sorrowful perusal the morning hours lagged dreadfully both warriors smoked innumerable cigars but only to find fault with the flavour thereof the lieutenant tried to keep his heart up by relating two or three stories at the points of each of which the major forced a boisterous laugh but the mirth upon both sides was visibly hollow dinner was set at noon the usual military dinner hour but little was consumed except a bottle of claret which the major who seldom drank seemed to consider it advisable to produce the after-dinner cigar lasted only until one o'clock newspapers by the noonday mail occupied their time for but a scant hour more and an attempted game of cribbage speedily dropped by unspoken but mutual consent suddenly the garden gate creaked the lieutenant sprang to his feet looked out of the window and exclaimed it's her darky he's got an answer oh major steady boy steady said the major arising hastily and laying his hand on the young man's shoulder as that excited person was hastening to the door officer and gentleman you know let sam open the door the bell rang the door was opened a word or two passed between the two servants and mrs whittleday's coachman appeared in the dining-room holding the letter the lieutenant eagerly reached for it but the sable carrier grinned politely said it's for de major sah was told to give it right into his hands and nobody else fulfilled his instructions and departed with many bows and smiles while the two soldiers dropped into their respective chairs hurry up major do please whispered the lieutenant but the veteran seemed an interminably long time in opening the dainty envelope in his hand official communications he opened with a dexterity suggesting sleight of hand but now he took a penknife from his pocket opened its smallest brightest blade and carefully cut mrs whittleday's envelope as he opened the letter his lower jaw fell and his eyes opened wide he read the letter through and re-read it his countenance indicating considerable satisfaction which presently was lost in an expression of puzzled wonder fred said he to the miserable lieutenant who started to his feet as a prisoner expecting a severe sentence might do what in creation did you write mrs whittleday just what you gave me to write replied the young man evidently astonished let me see my draft of it said the major the lieutenant opened a drawer in the major's desk took out a sheet of paper looked at it and cried i sent her your draft this is my letter and she imagined i wrote it and has accepted me gasped the major the wretched frederick turned pale and tottered toward a chair the major went over to him and spoke to him sympathizingly but despite his genial sorrow for the poor boy the major's heart was so full that he did not dare to show his face for a moment so he stood behind the lieutenant and looked across his own shoulder out of the window oh major exclaimed fred isn't it possible that you're mistaken here's a letter my boy said the major judge for yourself the young man took the letter in a mechanical sort of way and read as follows july twenty third eighteen fifty dear major i duly received your note of this morning and you may thank womanly curiosity for my knowing from whom the missive which you omitted to sign came i was accidentally looking out of my window and recognized the messenger 
i have made it an inflexible rule to laugh at declarations of love at first sight but when i remembered how long ago it was when first we met the steadfastness of your regard proved to me by a new fancy which i pray you not to crush that your astonishing fondness for east patten was partly on my account forbade my indulging in any lighter sentiment than that of honest gratitude you may call this evening for your answer which i suppose you with the ready conceit of your sex and profession will have already anticipated yours very truly helen whittleday the lieutenant groaned it's all up major you'll have to marry her twould be awfully ungentlemanly to let her know there was any mistake do you think so fred asked the major with a perceptible twitch at the corners of his mouth certainly i do replied the sorrowful lover and i'm sure you can learn to love her she is simply an angel a goddess confound it you can't help loving her you really believe so do you my boy asked the major with fatherly gravity but how would you feel about it as if no one else on earth was good enough for her as if she was the luckiest woman alive quickly answered the young man with a great deal of his natural spirit twould heal my wound entirely very well my boy said the major i'll put you out of your misery as soon as possible never had the major known an evening whose twilight was of such interminable duration when however the darkness was sufficient to conceal his face he walked quickly across the street and to the door of the whittleday mansion that his answer was what he supposed it would be is evinced by the fact that a few months later his resignation was accepted by the department and mrs whittleday became mrs mart in so strategic a manner that she never suspected the truth the major told his fiancée the story of the lieutenant's unfortunate love and so great was the fair widow's sympathy that she set herself the task of seeing the young man happily engaged this done she offered him the position of engineer of some mining work on her husband's estate and the major promised him rose cottage for a permanent residence as soon as he would find a mistress for it naturally the young man succumbed to the influences exerted against him and after mr and mrs doyson were fairly settled the major told his own wife to her intense amusement the history of the letter which induced her to change her name End of story eight. Story nine of Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story nine Buffle. How he came by his name, no one could tell. In the early days of the gold fever, there came to California a great many men who did not volunteer their names and as those about them had been equally reticent on their own advent they asked few questions of newcomers the hotels of the mining regions never kept registers for the accommodation of guests they were considered well-appointed hotels if they kept watertight roofs and well-stocked bars newcomers were usually designated at first by some peculiarity of physiognomy or dress and were known by such names as broken nose pink shirt crossbars gone ears and etc if afterward any man developed some peculiarity of character an observing and original miner would coin and apply a new name which would afterward be accepted as irrevocably as a name conferred by the holy rite of baptism no one wondered that buffle never divulged his real name or talked of his past life for in the mines he had such an unhappy faculty of winning at cards getting new horses without visible bills of sale taking drinks beyond ordinary power of computation stabbing and shooting that it was only reasonable to suppose that he had acquired these abilities at the sacrifice of the peace of some other community he was not vicious even a strict theologian could hardly have accused him of malice yet wherever he went he was promptly acknowledged chief of that peculiar class which renders law and sheriffs necessary evils 
he was not exactly a beauty miners seldom are yet a connoisseur in manliness could have justly wished there were a dash of the buffo blood in the well-regulated veins of many irreproachable characters in quieter neighbourhoods than fat pocket gulch where the scene of this story was located he was tall active prompt and generous and only those who have these qualities superadded to their own virtues are worthy to throw stones at his memory he was brave too his bravery had been frequently recorded in lead in the mining regions and such records were transmitted from place to place with an alacrity which put official zeal to the deepest blush at the fashionable hour of two o'clock at night mr buffle was entertaining some friends at his residence or to use the language of the mines there was a game up at buffle's in a shanty of the composite order of architecture it having a foundation of stone succeeded by logs a gable of coffin misfits and cracker boxes and a roof of bark and canvas buffle and three other miners were playing old sledge the table was an empty pork barrel the seats were respectively a block of wood a stone and a raisin box with a well-stuffed knapsack for the tallest man on one side of the shanty was a low platform of hewn logs which constituted the proprietor's couch when he slept on another was the door on the third were confusedly piled buffle's culinary utensils and on the fourth was a fireplace whose defective draught had been the agent of the fine frescoing of soot perceptible on the ceiling a single candle hung on a wire over the barrel and afforded light auxiliary to that thrown out by the fireplace the game had been going largely in buffle's favour as was usually the case when one of the opposition injudiciously placed an ace which was clearly from another pack of cards inasmuch as buffle who had dealt had the rightful ace in his own hand as it was the ace of trumps buffle's indignation arose and so did his person and pistol hang yer said he savagely you don't come to that game on me i've got that ace myself an ordinary man would have drawn pistol also but buffle's antagonist knew his only safety lay in keeping quiet so he only stared vacantly at the muzzle of the revolver that was so precisely aimed at his own head the two other players had risen to their feet and were mentally composing epitaphs for the victim when there was heard a decided knock on the door come in roared buffle's partner who was naturally the least excited of the four come in hanger if your life's insured the door opened slowly and a woman entered now while there were but few women in the camp the sight of a single woman was not at all unusual yet as she raised her veil buffle's revolver fell from his hands and the other players laid down their cards the partner of the guilty man being so overcome as to lay down his hand face upward then they all stared but not one of them spoke they wanted to but none knew how to do it it was not usually difficult for any of them to address such specimens of the gentler sex as found their way to fat pocket gulch but they all understood at once that this was a different sort of woman they looked reprovingly and beseechingly at each other but the woman at last broke the silence by saying i am sorry to disturb you gentlemen but i was told i could probably find mr buffle here here he is ma'am and yours truly said buffle removing his hat he could afford to she was not beautiful but she seemed to be in trouble and a troubled woman can command to the death even worse men than free and easy miners she had a refined pure face out of which two great brown eyes looked so tenderly and anxiously that these men forgot themselves at once she seemed young not more than twenty-three or four she was slightly built and dressed in a suit of plain black mr buffle said she i was going through by stage to san francisco when i overheard the driver say to a man seated by him that you knew more miners than any man in california that you had been through the whole mining country 
well mum said buffle with a delighted but sheepish look which would have become a missionary complimented on the number of converts he had made i have been around a good deal that's a fact and i reckon i stake to claim pretty much ever war in the diggins so i inferred from what the driver said she replied and i came down here to ask you a question here she looked uneasily at the other players the man who stole the ace translated it at once and said we'll get out if you say so mum but you needn't be afraid to say anything before us we know a lady when we see her and maybe some of us can give yer a lift if we can't i've only got to say that if yer let out any secrets grizzlies couldn't tear em out of any man in this crowd eh fellers you bet was the firm response of the remaining two and buffle quickly passed a demijohn to the ace thief as a sign of forgiveness and approbation thank you gentlemen god bless you said the woman earnestly my story is soon told i am looking for my husband and i must find him his name is alan baron buffle gazed thoughtfully in the fire and remarked names ain't much good in this country mum no man carries visitin cards and mighty few gets letters besides lots come here cause they're wanted elsewhere and they take names that ain't much like what their mothers give em maybe you could tell us something else to put us on the trail of him has he got both of his eyes and ears mum inquired one of the men of course he has you fool replied buffle savagely the lady's husband's a gentleman and tain't likely he's been chawed or gouged i asked parding mum said the offender in the most abject manner well he is of medium height slightly built has brown hair and eyes and wears a plain gold ring on the third finger of his left hand continued mrs baron got all his front teeth mum asked the man buffle had rebuked then he turned quickly to buffle who was frowning suspiciously and said appeasingly you know buffle that bein a gentleman don't keep a feller from losin his teeth in the natural course of things he had all his front teeth a few months ago replied mrs baron i do not know how to describe him further he had no scars moles or other peculiarities which might identify him except she continued with a slight blush a wife's blush which strongly tempted buffle to kneel and kiss the ground she stood on except a locket i once gave him with my portrait and which he always wore over his heart i can't believe he would take it off said she with a sob that was followed by a flood of tears the men twisted on their seats and showed every sign of uneasiness one stepped outside to cough another suddenly attacked the fire and poked it savagely buffle impolitely turned his back to the company while the fourth man lost himself in the contemplation of the king of spades which card ever afterward showed in its centre a blotch which seemed the result of a drop of water finally buffle broke the silence by saying i give my last ounce and my shooting iron besides mum if i could put you on his trail but i can't remember no such man can you fellows three melancholy nods replied in the negative i am very much obliged to you gentlemen said mrs baron i will go back to the crossing and take the next stage perhaps mr buffle if i send you my address when i reach san francisco you will let me know if you ever find any traces of him depend upon all of us for that mum replied buffle thank you said she and departed as suddenly as she had entered leaving the men staring stupidly at each other wonder how she got here from the crossin finally remarked one if she came alone she's got a black ride back said another at nine to fourteen miles to that crossin and she aren't to be travelin at all said little muggy the smallest man of the party i'm a family man or i was once and i tell you she ought to be where she can keep quiet and wait for what's comin soon the men glanced at each other significantly but without any of the levity which usually follows such an announcement in more cultured circles this game's up boys said buffle rising suddenly the stage don't reach the cross until noon and she's going to have this shanty to stay in till daylight anyhow you fellows had better get right away saying which buffle hurried out to look for mrs baron he soon overtook her and awkwardly said mum she stopped 
you don't need to start till after daylight to reach that stage mum and you better come back and rest yourself in my shanty till mornin i'm very much obliged sir she replied but don't be afeard mum said buffle hastily we're rough but a lady's as safe here as she be among her family you'll have the cabin all to yourself and i'll leave a revolver with you to make you feel better you are very kind sir but it will take me some time to get back horse lane perhaps no sir the truth is i walked good god ejaculated buffle i'll kill any scoundrel of a station agent that let a woman take such a walk as this i'll take you back on a good horse before noon to-morrow and i'll put a hole through that rascal right before your eyes mum mrs Barron shuddered at sight of which buffle mentally consigned his eyes to a locality boasting a superheated atmosphere for talking so roughly to a lady don't harm him mr buffle said she he knew nothing about it i asked him the road to fat pocket gulch and he pointed it out he did not know but what i had a horse or a carriage unfortunately the stage was robbed the day before yesterday and all my money was taken or i should not have walked here i assure you my passage is paid to san francisco and the driver told me that if i wished to come down here the next stage would take me through to san francisco when i got there i can soon obtain money from the east madam said buffle unconsciously taking off his hat any lady that'll make that walk by dark is clear gold all the way down to bedrock if your husband's in california i'll find em for you in spite of man or devil i will and i'll be on the trail in half an hour and you'd better stay here till i come back or send your word i don't want to brag but there ain't a man in the gulch that'll dare molest anything round my shanty and as there's plenty of pervisions thar plain but good yer can't suffer the spring is close by and you'll always find firewood by the door and if you want help about anything ask the first man you see and say i told you to mrs Barron looked earnestly into his face for a moment and then trusted him mr buffle she said he is the best man that ever lived but we were both proud and we quarrelled and he left me in anger i accidentally heard he was in california through an acquaintance who saw him leave new york on the california steamer if you see him tell him i was wrong and that i will die if he does not come back tell him tell him that never mind mum said buffle leading her hastily toward the shanty and talking with unusual rapidity i'll bring him back all right if i find him and find him i will if he's on top of the ground they entered the cabin and buffle was rather astonished at the appearance of his own home the men were gone but on the bare logs where buffle usually reposed they had spread their coats neatly and covered them with a blanket which little muggy usually wore the cards had disappeared and in their place lay a very small fragment of looking-glass the demijohn stood in its accustomed place but against it leaned a large chip on which was scrawled in charcoal the word water good said buffle approvingly now mum keep up your heart i tell yer i'll fetch him and any man at the gulch can tell yer that lion ain't my gate buffle slammed the door called at two or three other shanties and gave orders in a style befitting a feudal lord and in ten minutes was on horseback galloping furiously out on the trail to green flat the green flatites wondered at finding the great man among them and treated him with the most painful civility as he neither hung about the saloon got up a game nor provoked a horse trade it was immediately surmised that he was looking for some one and each man searchingly questioned his trembling memory whether he had ever done buffle an injury all preserved a respectful silence as a buffle walked from claim to claim carefully scrutinizing many and all breathed freer as they saw him and his horse disappear over the hill on the sonora trail at sonora he considered it wise to stay over sunday not to enjoy religious privileges but because on sunday sinners from all parts of the country round flocked into sonora to commune with the spirits infernal rather than celestial gathered there he made the tour of all the saloons dashed eagerly at two or three men with plain gold rings on left forefingers discussedly found them the wrong men beyond doubt 
cursed them, and invited them to drink. Then he closely catechized all the barkeepers, who were the only reliable directories in that country. They were anxious to oblige him, but none could remember such a man. So Buffle took his horse and sought his man elsewhere. Meanwhile, Mrs. Barron remained in camp, where she was cared for in a manner which called out her astonishment equally with her gratitude. Buffle was hardly well out of the gulch when Mrs. Barron heard a knock at the door. She opened it, and a man handed her a frying pan with the remark, Buffle is cracked, and hastily disappeared. In the morning she was awakened by a crash outside the door, and on looking out discovered a quantity of firewood ready cut. Each morning thereafter found in the same place a fresh supply, which was usually decorated with offerings of different degrees of appropriateness pieces of fresh meat strings of dried ditto blankets enough for a large hotel little packages of gold dust case knives and forks cans of salt butter and all sorts of provisions in quantity each man in camp fondly believed his own particular revolver was better than any other and as a natural consequence the camp became almost peaceful by reason of the number of pistols that were left in front of mrs barron's door but she carefully left them alone and when this was discovered the boys sorrowfully removed them then old griff living up the gulch with a horrible bulldog for companion brought his darling animal down late one dark night and tied him near the lady's residence where he discoursed sweet sounds for two hours until to mrs barron's delight he broke his chain and returned to his old home then sandy top the ace thief suddenly left camp many were the surmises and bets on the subject and on the third day when two men one of whom believed he had gone to steal a mule and the other believed he had rolled into the creek while drunk were about to refer the whole matter to pistols they were surprised at seeing sandy top stagger into camp under a large unsightly bundle the next day mrs barron ate from crockery instead of tin and had a china washbowl and pitcher little muggy who sold out his claim the day after buffle left went to san francisco but reappeared in camp in a few days with a large bundle a handsaw and a plane some light was thrown on the contents of the bundle by sundry scraps of linen cotton and very soft flannel that the wind occasionally blew from the direction of mrs barron's abode but why muggy suddenly needed a very large window in the only boarded side of his house why he never staked another claim and went to washin why his door always had to be unlocked from the inside before any one could get in instead of being ajar as was the usual custom with doors at fat pocket gulch why visitors always found the floor strewn with shavings and blocks but were told to mind their business if they asked what he was makin and why upper crust an aristocratic young reprobate who had been a doctor in the states had suddenly taken up his abode with muggy were mysteries unsolvable by the united intellects of fat pocket gulch it was finally suggested by some one that as muggy had often and fluently cursed the rockers used to wash out dirt along the gulch it was likely enough he was inventing a new one and the ex-doctor who of course knew something about chemistry was helping him to work an amalgamator into it a careful comparison of bets showed this to be a fairly accepted opinion and so the matter rested meanwhile buffle had been untiring in his search as his horse could he have spoken would have testified men wondered what baron had done to buffle and odds of ten to one that some undertaker would soon have reason to bless buffle were freely offered but seldom taken one night buffle's horse galloped into deadlock ridge and the rider hailing the first man he met inquired the way to the saloon i don't know replied the man come no foolin thar said buffle indignantly i don't know i tell you i don't drink hang yer roared buffle in honest fury at what seemed to him the most stupendous lie ever told by a miner i'll teach her to lie to me and out came buffle's pistol the man saw his danger and springing at buffle with the agility of a cat 
snatched the pistol and threw it on the ground in an instant buffle's hand had firmly grasped the man by his shirt collar and the horse taking fright buffle a second later found in his hand a torn piece of red flannel a chain and a locket while the man lay on the ground at last exclaimed buffle convinced that he had found his man but his emotions were quickly cooled by the man on the road who jumping from the ground picked up buffle's pistol cocked and aimed it and spoke in a grating voice as if through set teeth give back that locket this second or as god lives i'll take it out of a dead man's hand the rapidity of human thought is never so beautifully illustrated as when the owner of a human mind is serving involuntarily as a target my friend said buffle if i've got anything of yourn you can have it on proven property we'll go to whar that first light is up above i'll walk the horse slow and you can keep me covered with the pistol ain't that fair be quick then said the man excitedly start the trip was not more than two minutes in length but it seemed a good hour to buffle whose acquaintanceship the delicacy of the trigger of his beloved pistol caused his past life to pass in retrospect before him several times before they reached the light the light proved to be in the saloon whose locality had provoked the quarrel the saloon was full the door was open and there was a buzz of astonishment which culminated in a volley of ejaculations in which strength predominated over elegance as a large man followed closely by a small man with a cocked pistol marched up to the bar gentlemen said buffle this feller says i've got some of his property and he's come here to prove it now feller what's your claim a chain and a locket said the man hang you i see them in your hand now anybody can see a chain and locket in my hand said buffle but that don't make it yourn the locket contains the portrait of a lady and the inscription francis to allen look quick or i'll shoot said the little man savagely buffle opened it and saw mrs barron's portrait mister you're right said he here's your property and i'll apologize or drink or fight or apologize and drink and fight whichever is your style first however if you'll drop that pistol i'll drink myself considerin uh, well never mind denominate your pies and gentlemen said he as the audience crowded to the bar buffle whispered the barkeeper who knew the great man by sight he's a littler man than you i know it boss replied buffle most brazenly he says he don't drink never saw him here before there he's going out now said the barkeeper buffle turned and dashed through the crowd all who held glasses quickly laid them down and followed stand back the whole crowd of yours said buffle this ain't no fight me and the gentleman got private business and laying his hand on baron's shoulder he said what are you doing here when you know a lady like that sufferin hell for abusing heaven replied baron passionately then why don't you go back inquired buffle because i've got no money all luck has failed me ever since i left home shipwreck hunger poverty come back a minute interrupted buffle i forgot to come down with the dust for the drinks now I tell you what i want you to go back to my camp i've got plenty of gold and it's no good to me only for gambling and drinking you're welcome to enough of it to get yourself home and get on your feet when you get there baron looked doubtingly at him as they entered the saloon perhaps somebody here can tell this gentleman my name said buffle buffle said several voices in chorus bully now perhaps you same fellows can tell him if i'm a man of my word you bet responded the same chorus and now perhaps some of you'll sell me a good horse providing you don't want him stole mighty sudden several men invited attention to their respective animals tied near the door promptly selecting one paying for it and settling with the barkeeper and mounting his own horse while baron mounted the new one the two men galloped away leaving the bystanders lost in astonishment from which they only recovered after almost superhuman industry on the part of the barkeeper one evening when the daily labors and household cares of the fat pocket gulchites had ended the residents of that quiet village were congregated as usual at the saloon 
it was too early for gambling and fightin and the boys chatted peacefully pausing only a few times to drink here's her which had become the standard toast of the gulch conversation turned on muggy's invention and a few bets were exchanged which showed the boys were not quite sure it was a rocker after all suddenly sandy top who had been leaning against the door frame and looking in the direction of buffle's old cabin ejaculated tis a rocker boys it's a rocker but not that kind the boys poured out the door and saw an unusual procession approaching mrs barron's cabin first came upper crust the young ex-doctor then an irish woman from a neighboring settlement and then muggy bearing a baby's cradle neatly made of pine boards the doctor and woman went in and muggy dropping the cradle ran at full speed to the saloon and up to the bar the crowd following muggy looked along the line saw all the glasses were filled and in hand and then raising his own exclaimed here's her boys and then went into a fully developed boo-hoo and he was not alone for once the boys watered their liquor and purer water god never made it was some moments before shirt-sleeves ceased to officiate as handkerchiefs but just as the boys commenced to look savagely at each other as if threatening cold lead if any one suspected undue tenderness sandy top who had returned to his post at the door to give ease to the stream which his sleeve could not staunch again startled the crowd by staring earnestly toward the hill over which led the trail and exclaiming good god there was another rush to the door and there galloping down the trail was buffle and another man the boys stared at each other but said nothing their gift of swearing was not equal to the occasion steadily they stared at the two men until buffle reining back a little pointed his pistol threateningly they took the hint and after they were all inside sandy top closed the door and the shutters of the unglazed windows thar's my shanty said buffle as they neared it from one side that one with two barrels for a chimney you just go right in i'll be there as soon as i put up the hosses as they reached the front both men started at the sight of the cradle why i didn't know you were a married man buffle said his companion i well i i don't tell everything stammered buffle and catching the bridle of baron's horse the moment his rider had dismounted buffle dashed off to the saloon and took numerous solitary drinks at which no one took offence then he turned nodded significantly toward the old shanty and asked how long since not quite yet you got him here in time buffle said muggy thank the lord said buffle his lips were very familiar with the name of the lord but they had never before used it in this sense then while several men were getting ready to ask buffle where he found his man californians never ask questions in a hurry there came from the direction of buffle's shanty the sound of a subdued cry gentlemen said the barkeeper there's no more drinking at this bar to-night until until i say so no one murmured no one swore no one suggested a game an old enemy of buffle's happened in but that worthy instead of feeling for his pistol quietly left the leaning post and bowed his enemy into it the boys stood and sat about studied the cracks in the floor the pattern of the shutters contemplated the insides of their hats and chewed tobacco as if their lives depended on it buffle made frequent trips to the door and looked out suddenly he closed the door and had barely time to whisper no noise now or i'll shoot when the doctor walked in the crowd arose it's all right gentlemen said the doctor as fine a boy as i ever saw my treat for the rest of the evening boys said the barkeeper hurriedly crowding glasses and bottles on the bar er him him junior buffle doc and old rocker shop as some happily inspired miner dubbed little muggy were drunk successively the door opened again and in walked alan baron glancing quickly about he soon distinguished buffle he grasped his hand looked at him steadily in the eye and exclaimed buffle you 
he was a harvard graduate and a fine talker was alan baron but when he had spoken two words he somehow forgot the remainder of the speech he had made up on his way over his silence for two or three seconds seemed of hours to every man who looked on his face so that it was a relief to all when he gave buffle a mighty hug and then precipitately retreated buffle looked sheepish and shook himself that feller can out hug a grizzly said he boys he continued that chap's been buckin again luck since he's been in the diggins and is clean busted but his luck began to turn this evenin and here's what goes for keepin the ball a rollin here's my ante saying which he laid his old hat on the bar took out his buckskin bag of gold dust and emptied it into the hat bags came out of pockets all around and were either entirely emptied or had their contents largely diminished by knife blades which scooped out the precious dust and dropped it into the hat there said buffle looking into the hat i reckon that'll carry em back to their folks for a fortnight the saloon was as quiet as a well-ordered prayer meeting and it was solemnly decided that no fight with pistols should take place nearer than the bend which was at least a mile from where the new residence cradle was located one pleasant quiet evening buffle who frequently passed an hour with baron on the latter's woodpile was seen approaching the saloon with a very small bundle which nevertheless occupied both his arms and all his attention it by thunder said one so it was a wee pink-faced blue-eyed fuzzy-topped little thing with one hand frantically clutching three hairs of buffle's beard see the little thing pull said one is that all the nose they have at first asked another seriously can't you take them pipes out of your mouths when a baby's around indignantly demanded another little muggy edged his way through the crowd threw away his quid of tobacco took the baby from buffle and kissed it a dozen times i'm going home fellers said muggy finally i'm wanted by the lawyers for cutting a man that sassed me while i was shoemaking but i'm a-going to see my young uns even if all creation wants me and i'm a-going too said buffle i'm wanted pretty bad by some that's east but i reckon i'm well enough hid by the bar that's growed since i was a boy and dug out from old varmint i've had a new taste of decency lately and i'm going to see if i can't stand it for a steady diet that chap over to the shanty says he can get me something to do and anything's better than gamblin and drinkin and fightin it's again the law to carry shootin irons there buffle suggested one yes and they got a new kind of a law there to keep a man from takin his bitters said another yes said buffle all that's mighty tough but if a feller's bound for bedrock he might as well get that all of a sudden if he can buffle started toward the door stopped as if he had something else to say started again hesitated feigned indignation at the baby flushed the least bit opened the door partly closed it again squeezed himself out and displaying only the tip of his nose roared this baby's name is alan buffle baron alan buffle baron and then rushed at full speed to leave the baby at home while the boys clinked glasses melodiously at the end of another fortnight there was a procession formed at fat pocket gulch two horses one wearing a side saddle were brought to the door of buffle's old house and mrs baron and her husband mounted them they were soon joined by buffle and muggy for months after there was mourning far and wide among owners of mules and horses for each gulchite had been out stealing that he might ride with the escort which was to see the barons safely to the crossing an advance guard was sent ahead and the party were about to start when buffle suddenly dismounted and entered his old cabin when he reappeared a cloud of smoke followed him bar said he a moment later as flames were seen bursting through the roof no galoot of a miner don't live in that shanty after that git away galloped the party the baby in the arms of its father the crossing was safely reached and the stage had room for the whole party and after a hearty handshaking all around the stage started sandy top threw one of his only two shoes after it for luck 
as the stage was disappearing around a bend a little way from the crossing the back curtain was suddenly thrown up a baby backed by a white hat and yellow beard was seen and a familiar voice was heard to roar alan buffle baron End of story nine.